This is day one, lecture one of preseason. Um, we got a first topic today. We're talking about shoes and different types of uh, shoe wear. I'm coming to you from this high quality soundproof studio in my bedroom. So we're making shift and uh, we'll make do. So without further ado, let's get going here. So three tips for selecting your shoes. So three things. We're gonna talk about the drop of your shoe, which is the amount of distance between your heel and the ground. And that's dictated by the size of the heel and the back of the shoe. We've got the width of the shoe, which is the distance across. And then we have finally the hot topic of the different types of shoes. Is it a stability? Is it a motor control? Is it a neutral shoe? And what's best for you or for anybody if it, for that uh, matter? These are some implications. You can have some Achilles and calf pains as a result of that, and we'll explain why. Foot pain if you have a shoe that's too narrow. And also you can get um, overuse or impact type injuries um, if you've got shin splints or knee pain, depending on what type of shoe, what kind of terrain. With anything, there's no one perfect shoe for everybody. And if someone tells you there is, it's not true. That's the beauty of human nature, and we're all different. So let's get right into it. With anything, this style, whether it's the new pair of shoes, a new bed, a new pillow, you're trying to, um, to see if it's right for you, we've got this ABA style of, of kinematic uh, awareness, we call it. So A is whatever your original is, um, and then B is what we're trying to test. So let's say you go in the shoe store, you've got your old pair of shoes, and you do some heel lifts, you walk back and forth, jump a couple of times, you should put the new shoe B on, which you're trying to compare, do the same thing, heel raise, walk, jump. And if you don't go back to A, you're not necessarily gonna pick up on those subtle differences. That is so key of going back to A. And you go back and do all those same things. I've done it before, I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe the cushion that I've lost in these shoes until I went back to the original too, instead of just putting on a new pair. So um, that style is good for all this kind of stuff. So topic one, heel drop. So most of us tend to uh, walk around the house with barefoot. Um, if we've got hardwoods, the lower that our heel is towards the ground, the more stress that's going to go through the back side of our uh, structures of our foot. So we've got different types of shoes. You've got you've heard of zero drops or zero. What that means is it's the same distance across the entire length of the shoe. Um, and some shoes have a little bit higher one. So the ones that are known for having a zero drop are the Ultras, the Hoka's, um, and you can kind of see a good example here of where that heel sits in relation to that ground. Um, I've got an example here of an Ultra, which is a zero drop, which has the same distance, the same stack height throughout the entirety, versus here where we have a little bit higher of a heel. So some of the implications for that is if someone's trying to land with the mid part of their foot, if they have a bigger heel and they're trying to come down, if there's a bigger heel to it, it's harder to land on the mid portion of your foot. So we're naturally going to be a little bit more of a heel striker, which tends to, not always, cause us to lean a little bit further out in front of our center of mass, which we'll talk about later in the week with that form and overstriding of what that can do. So um, the other thing that we see commonly is people that go from a heel, whether it be this is what you're wearing to work, your dress shoes, normal shoes that have a certain amount of heel to them, if you go down to a four millimeter or a zero drop too fast, tissues, especially as we get older, tissues being muscle, tendon, they don't like quick changes or adaptations in muscle length, so or tendon length for that matter. So if my heel sits a little bit lower because I went from a shoe that had a 12 millimeter heel to it to a zero, that's gonna put some more stress through it and potentially cause more length tension into your calf and to your Achilles as well. So we see that a lot of times going too soon to a zero drop. So on the other end of the spectrum, if it's not from a pathological standpoint, um, if someone is lacking ankle dorsiflexion range motion, the ability to get your knee past your toe, um, and we're going to do a test tomorrow to see are you lacking, do you have enough range of motion that you need. If somebody is lacking the ability to get their knee past their toe, one compensation that we could do is by having a shoe that has a little bit higher of a heel to it, that can compensate for that. If we have someone that can't squat, one of the first things we'll do is we'll raise their heels up, which reduces the dorsiflexion demand. And if they're able to now go down further, that's suggestive that it is from lack of ankle dorsiflexion range of motion. So if I've got someone that has really tight ankles, whether it be calves, Achilles, or they had a history of ankle sprains, it might not be the best idea to get them in a zero drop um, because we need to kind of meet them in the middle. We want to still work on the mobility, improving the length, tension, relationship, stretching, um, self-mobilizations, while also having a shoe that kind of fits um, that parameter too. So we don't want to go from one extreme to the other and not just give up on improving your dorsiflexion range of motion. 
Um, so you'll see in this picture here, the test that we'll do is how far away can you go, bringing the foot away from the wall, keeping the heel down and touching the knee to the wall. If the heel comes up, it's too tight. There's a certain distance about four to five inches away from the wall, which is considered normal. And you'll see in this picture, same distance. I cannot touch the wall there. Here, I put my heel up just slightly, just to mimic what a heel would do for a shoe. And now I'm able to go a little bit further into the wall. So that's just a good example of um, kind of masking or temporarily assisting in a lack of range of motion. When we don't have that ability to get our knee past our toe, we will compensate, we'll lean forward more. Our knee doesn't go through as much as this excursion, which means your quad isn't gonna be working. Um, it's gonna be more of the inner structures of your body, your cartilage, your joints, that's gonna be taking that impact. So we want a good healthy ability to get your knee past your toe. Um, and this is one way that we can um, help for that. So two, <laughs> I'm gonna make this simple, shoe width. If I got this guy and we're out pant shopping, I don't know why I'd be taking him pant shopping, but maybe he wants me to go pant shopping with him. And we're trying to get him in these tight little jeans. It's, it's not gonna work. It, it's gonna hurt. It's not gonna feel good. So I don't wanna take a fat foot. Sorry, that's my roommate's foot. Um, I'm not gonna take a fat foot and try to cram it into a narrow shoe. Some shoes have a wider toe box and have more narrow. A great test that you can do is take the sole of the shoe out Put it on the ground and then step on it. Make sure that if you trace around your foot, and you have to be in standing because your arch does collapse when you stand, make sure that you are falling within the confines of that sole of that shoe. If not, if it's hanging over the edge, it's, chances are it's probably too narrow. So that can cause issues um, with the, the width of your foot. Also, if somebody has a, just a really tight shoe, having the elastic shoelaces like lock lace, um, hickeys, um, they're all the same length though. That can also allow some of that normal uh, mobility of your foot as we run or as we land. If we have a shoe that's too tight, um, and we'll see that sometimes when they take the shoes off or the socks off, you can see the imprint of their socks, you can see the shoelaces. That's not good. We want a normal ability of the foot to, to splay. When we land, the bones do separate and that helps to act as a shock absorber. If we don't allow that to happen, it's just like with my hand. If I were to hit the ground with my hand tight like this versus allowing it to kind of splay out, it's going to sound very differently. It's going to hit very differently. So we want to allow the foot to do its natural, uh, natural mechanics in the, in the shoe and not be too tight. Third is the type of shoe. So this is kind of the hot topic. We've got your motor control, you've got your neutral, and you've got your stability. They did a study a number of years ago where they took all three different types of shoes and then all different types of foot postures, high arch, low arch, and neutral, and they randomized it. The group that did the, the worst was the, I'm very flat footed in a stability shoe um, and had the highest amount of injury. The group that did the best was actually the, um, the flat footed in a neutral shoe. And some of the reason why that is, and I've switched over from those type of shoes to more of a neutral cushion shoe, for some of these reasons that I'm gonna talk about. So every time that the foot comes off the ground and lands, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. If we have someone who weighs 150 pounds, we're talking up to two and a half times their body weight every single time they land. And with that force has to go somewhere. We want that shoe to be like an exoskeleton of cartilage that dampens that load or that impact before it even gets to the ankle, the knee, into the hip. So imagine that same scenario. If I had a shoe and the bottom of that shoe was a brick, and this is kind of somewhat irregardless of weight, although the denser it is, the heavier it's gonna be. If I have a brick versus a sponge, this is gonna take away, um, this is gonna take away some performance because it is gonna cause the shoe to take some of the impact and load. So you are gonna be technically slightly slower. But that's why different distances, whether it be tracks or sprints, they tend to have lighter shoes that are firmer because they don't need to go a super long distance. So if we're talking about injury and some of the distances that we're gonna be doing in this league, we're looking about average of three miles. I wanna make sure I've got a good cushion shoe. The lighter it is, the better, the more cushion. If I were to also think of the same scenario is if I had a wall and I had a punching bag and my punching bag was either made out of brick or it was made out of a sponge, I'm gonna want that sponge, especially if we're talking about 1,600, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 punches every time we land. I want that shoe to kind of work for me. So the more cushion, the more lighter, the neutral, the better. They've also shown that every one and a half ounces of weight of increase is 1% increase in oxygen consumption that our body has to do. So it's not as energy efficient. If I'm trying to have that higher turnover rate or that cadence, that 180 steps per minute, um, it's gonna be harder with the heavier shoe and cause a little bit more torque on the joints. So 
uh, as light as you can get away with, as cushioned, as supportive as possible. So sometimes I'll take a shoe and I'll slap it against the ground. The louder it is, the more dense it is, it's not gonna dissipate forces as much. The softer, the quieter it is, um, the more I know the shoe's gonna be working for me. So that's kind of a big one, is just kind of getting away from that concept of a hard, stiff, like dense shoe. Um, so again, that's not for everybody. If I have somebody that has knee osteoarthritis versus uh, neuropathy where they can't feel their feet and they don't know where their feet are, it may be advantageous to them to have a lower profile um, and less distance between the ground and the bottom of their foot. So um, again, light, cushion, neutral. End of the day, if you say, hey, I've been using this control, motor control shoe for years and it works for me, Great, I'm not trying to talk you out of any of that stuff. If it works for you, that's fantastic. But if you're having knee issues, if you're having foot or ankle issues, um, just consider consider that and don't be um, kind of married to old schools of thought. So any questions, uh, go and post down below. Um, and if you got any other uh, topics you wanna see uh, next week, uh, feel free to shoot me a message. Thank you.